All right, everybody. What's going on? Everybody ready? Class four? It's pretty hot here in Oakland. I don't know how it is in your part of the world. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> today we are going to talk about proteins. Um, depending on who you are, and if you're me, you might think uh, that proteins are the coolest part of biology, bioengineering, and all that, that other junk. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, cells are really cool, uh, but, you know, cells, like, I wish there were no cells and it was just proteins. Life would be way cooler. Um, <clears throat> proteins are the things that make everything work, make cells work, make what everything, everything work, right? And uh, that's why they're so cool. Like, proteins are literally tiny little robots, right? And these proteins do everything in cells. They move the ions in and out of cells. They, they replicate the DNA. They make other proteins. Like, proteins are the thing that is amazing. Now, here's the crazy, crazy thing. Proteins, like, they can make light. They can absorb light. They can break almost any chemical bond you can imagine, right? They can make almost any chemical bond. Proteins can do almost anything that we could imagine them to do. They are capable of doing. If you could say right now, like, I want to make a protein and make it better than current proteins, you know, have new amino acids that we didn't have before, have some extra special powers, I don't think that there is anything you could do that could really make proteins better. Yeah. Yeah. Like give them more functionality. I don't think I don't think that's possible. That's how awesome proteins are. So that's why I hope, maybe after today's lecture, you think proteins are awesome also. Okay? Yeah? You with me on this one? I hope you are. All right. Now let me see if I could find some images to help out. <clears throat> because we're going to talk about how proteins work. Let's pull up molecular biology of the cell. I'm sure uh, it has some good pictures that we can use. Molecular biology of the cell. Let's go down. Goo, 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 goo. Uh, need to go to chapter three. Let's see. All right. Lots of panels. Lots of stuff. Okay. Let's see. All right. Chapter three proteins. All right. Here we go. Let me change my screen. Whew. All right. Proteins. All right. So there is. So we can't. Proteins are tiny, 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 right? We can't currently see them with 
our naked eye. Um, I guess maybe giant protein complexes like the ribosome. If you have a really high power magnification microscope, light microscope, you might be able to see it with your naked eye, but chances are you cannot see it with your naked eye. <laughs> but proteins, we can look at their structures. Now, there's two main techniques we use to look at protein structures. One is called X-ray crystallography, um, and the other is called NMR spectroscopy. Also, cryo-EM is becoming a big technique. Now, basically, what these techniques do is they use different measurements to be able to tell where the atoms of the protein are located in space. And then from that, you can reconstruct a model of the protein. And proteins look something like this, right? So the main uh, way that scientists generally look at proteins is what they call the cartoon representation. And it looks like this. You have these arrows, which are beta sheets. And you have these weird circular things, which are alpha helices. Now, proteins have certain structural elements that occur in them. And beta sheets and alpha helices are the two main structural elements. Now, what causes these beta sheets and alpha helices to form? That is the amino acids. So, each amino acid in a protein, there's generally 20 different amino acids. Um, they all have different, what they call side chains. So the backbone of an amino acid is always going to be the same. We have this NH, CH, CO. That's always going to be the same in every amino acid. That's the peptide backbone. That's the backbone of the protein. It's what holds the protein together. Now, coming off of this backbone is going to be what they call a side chain. These side chains are going to be different for each amino acid, and they're going to have different characteristics. So like a glutamic acid or spartic acid, they're going to have a, a negative charge, and they're going to be acidic, right? <clears throat> Alanine and valine, right? they're going to be pretty non-interactive because they're just, uh, you know, carbon side chains with hydrogen. We call that hydrophobic. Or here, they call it nonpolar. Then you're going to have other side chains that are positive or have nitrogens. Now, glutamine has nitrogen and oxygen, and so does asparagine, right? But there are also side chains. Um, oh, what, what did I do? No. God damn it. I lost it. Where, where was I? How did that happen? Gosh darn it. Everything was so great. And then I messed it up. Oh my, somehow it skipped up. All right. <coughs> and you also have, you know, side chains that have, are really big. And you have weird side chains like proline that actually form a connection on the backbone with itself. Now, each of these side chains have, because they have different properties, because they can form different bonds, you can imagine if you put them together in a string, right? So if you take a peptide backbone and put them together and you have all these side chains sticking off, they're going to interact differently with each other, right? Their different interactions it is what causes 
the shape of the protein to happen, right? Now, proteins generally, not always the case, but generally, let's just say, proteins will fold spontaneously. Now, what that means is if you take a protein and put it in water, just a polypeptide chain, it'll fold into its structure. Now, this is not always the case. <coughs> Some proteins are really complex and they need other proteins to help them fold. But we can say that it's a, it's a, um, a, a good principle of proteins. Proteins can spontaneously fold. Now, proteins spontaneously fold, we assume, because they have what is called a hydrophobic core. Now, hydrophobic means disliking water, right? And when you dislike water, it's like oil. If you ever added a drop of oil to water, what happens is the oil droplet will all come together and it'll sit there on top of the water all by itself, right? It won't disperse in the water. It'll be all together. It's the same thing with a protein. What happens is all these hydrophobic residues that don't like water, they all get shoved together in the middle of the protein and the protein kind of collapses, right? Now, when this happens, we get the protein structure and we get the secondary structure these alpha helices and these beta sheets, right? So beta sheets are generally defined by their rigidity and that they connect between each other. So generally, you have more than one beta sheet next to each other. You usually don't see a single beta sheet by itself, though it's possible. Generally, beta sheets are next to each other and they hydrogen bond across to each other. Alpha helices, they form these turns in a regular pattern and they form hydrogen, they form bonds between the amino acid residues to create this structure. And it's pretty stable structure, both alpha helices and beta sheets, right? So these molecules are pretty stable. So there are some proteins that you can heat up to boiling and they won't come apart, right? They, they won't unfold at all or they barely unfold. It's uh, pretty impressive. Now the majority of proteins, if you heat them up to boiling, they'll fall apart. The heat energy, what it does is it breaks apart all these bonds, it breaks apart the hydrophobic core of the protein and the protein just completely unfolds and it becomes a polypeptide chain. Um, but, you know, there are some proteins that that does not happen to. <clears throat> now, proteins form these structures and that is what gives them function, right? So you have to think of the amino acids and the structure of the protein like robots and like modular pieces of a robot, right? And, you know, like say you want your robot to have a laser beam. Well, you put a laser beam on it. Say you want it to have a hand that is a chainsaw. Well, you put that on it. And say you want it to have wheels for legs. Well, you put those on it. Proteins are the same way. To a certain extent, you can pick and choose these different functional parts of a protein and swap them in and out. <clears throat> now, generally, they call these different parts domains. It's a protein domain, and a protein domain has the function of the protein. Um, now, not every part of a protein domain is 100% functional. Usually, the structure of the protein is there to support the functional part, right? Just like 
um, you know, the bearing is there to support the wheel by helping it turn. So the domain is a modular part of a protein that you can actually swap between proteins and actually create different functional modules, interestingly enough, right? So you can engineer your own proteins by swapping out these different functional modules, right? So maybe, so maybe um, you've heard of something like CRISPR, right? Now CRISPR, what CRISPR is, is a, uh, CRISPR is a enzyme that cuts DNA. But before CRISPR, they used what's called a zinc finger nuclease. Now, they knew that zinc fingers bind DNA, and they knew that nucleases could cut DNA. So what they found out was that, well, if we connect a nuclease to a zinc finger protein, a zinc finger domain to a nuclease domain, what will happen is we could bind DNA and cut DNA, right? So like, even before there was CRISPR, People were able to swap in and out these modular parts of proteins to do basically the exact same thing that CRISPR does. It's a little more difficult because in CRISPR, the, you use RNA to match DNA. And as we talked about before, RNA and DNA combine because they're complementary. Whereas in zinc finger nucleases, what you have to do is you have to actually engineer the protein to bind DNA, right? So they're more complicated, but it gives you an idea about what's possible. Now, there's a huge field of optogenetics. <coughs> optogenetics is huge. I don't know if you guys have ever seen optogenetics. <coughs> now, um, let's see if I could find this video. It's a really cool rack <coughs> so what they did is that uh, they engineered a protein um, that controls light so a protein that responds to light right and what they did was with this protein is they connected it to another protein called a rack domain now what this did was it allowed them to actually control the movement of the cell with light. So let me find a video. <coughs> All right. Here we go. Let's go here. Let's display capture. Let me. Uh, All right, here we go. Let's check out this one first. All right. Oh man, it's a QuickTime movie. Do I even have QuickTime? Does anybody have QuickTime anymore? Good Lord.
What is that called? Does anybody remember? Here we go. All right, let's see if this works. Okay, so you can see red flashes, and red flashes are flashing and activating the light activated protein on a specific part of the cell. And as they do that, the cell moves towards where the light is being shown. So let's try another one. <coughs> So you can see they're using the light to control the directional motion of the cell. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So basically what they did was they swapped two, they connected two protein domains together that normally don't work together. And they engineered them to work together so they could use light to control the movement of human cells. That's pretty cool. No, we will not be teaching that in our human cell engineering class. Um, <laughs> maybe we should. Maybe we should get that construct and try it out. No, I think uh, it requires a really complex microscopy setup, which... I think it's outside the scope of DIY science right now, but <clears throat> what it, it gives you an idea about is uh, how you can take these different protein domains and see what they do, right? Put them together, arrange them in different parts. So people have put together lots of different things and, and created all sorts of cool stuff. And so... When you're reading about proteins or you're reading about something that happens in a cell, right? The idea, ideas that you can and should have are like, well, you know, is there a way I can connect that to this? Is there a way I can make that light controlled? Is there a way I can connect this to other protein that I know how it works, right? Because proteins are basically the building blocks to engineer cells. Now, DNA is what creates the protein, right? DNA is that like code that you write that creates the protein. But proteins are the actual functional part that do something. So what you're essentially doing with DNA is you're making the protein that's going to engineer the cell, right? You're making the protein that's going to engineer the organism. And that's, you know, crazy. Let me find something else. Let me see if I can find this. <laughs> so there's another form of optogenetics in which they took um, a protein from algae. It's called the channel rhodopsin protein. And... Uh, what this protein does is when you shine light on it in algae, it causes um, cations to enter the cell. Now, you'd probably be like, eh, well, cations entering cells, I don't know if that's that interesting. Um, and you may be right. But the thing is, in neurons, if you let a bunch of cations enter a cell, you can cause an action potential, right? So if you can cause action potential, you can do interesting stuff. Now here, maybe it's interesting, maybe it's crazy, but here they have a mouse and they, they genetically engineered some of its neurons in its brain with this channel rhodopsin. And when they shine a light on its brain, it starts to run around. 
they are controlling the locomotion of the mouse with light. Is that crazy or what? Right? So watch it again. You got the mouse is still, just hanging out, hanging out, not really doing much. They turn on the blue light, the mouse starts running around. Does a couple laps. They turn off the blue light and the mouse stops. What? All right? So like you can take proteins, not just modular parts of proteins, but you can take whole proteins from other organisms, stick them into new organisms, and you could have them do new things. I don't get why you wouldn't do this in your human genetics set. <laughs> um, Justin, you know, it would be awesome if you could do optogenetic experiments in animals in college classes. Now, you know, that's one of the things that our classes are trying to overcome is hands-on laboratory skills and experiences. Most colleges don't even teach it. In college, the amount of hands-on lab experience I had was so minimal. I even did, like, research projects with professors and still, like, hands-on lab experience I did was so small. It was so small, Right? So, like, it would be awesome if we could actually do these experiments because, you know, they're not really theoretically difficult in any way. It's just that, like, the way the system is set up, it's not set up to help people learn how to do this shit, you know? It's set up to keep knowledge centralized. I never made undergrads... Um, I had undergrads work in the lab. The hard thing was, is just that, like, uh, it's time limited. It's all these other things. So when I was a graduate student and I worked on really, you know, my PhD is in biophysics and most of the stuff I did was like thermodynamic stuff. So it wasn't like experiments on cells or animals. Um, <coughs> Oh, I never made, made undergrads run around the lab. <laughs> no, I did not. I think I probably tried a few times. Um, but yeah. Now, so my PhD, I did study a lot of optogenetic stuff. That's why I'm bringing it up here. Um, because, uh, you know, it's something that I know a lot about. Um, but most of my stuff... Um, we're <laughs> cats must have this protein. That's that's true. You shine a laser pointer and cats will really go after it, right? Um, it's possible. It is possible. Yeah. And I don't know how serious I'm being, so uh, you know, take take that with whatever you will. But <laughs> yeah, no, uh Proteins are my favorite, and optogenetics, I think, is really cool. It's really awesome, right? So we have all these different protein structures and all these different things that make proteins do stuff, right? You can control that by engineering different proteins. Now, if you want to get hardcore into protein engineering, you really need to intimately know about proteins and so like myself I had to spend so much time with proteins you know I know all the amino acids I could look at a protein sequence and I could have an idea of what's going on in that protein based on the protein sequence I, I look at a protein structure and I see the different amino acids in the protein and I can tell what they're doing, what effect they're going to have, all these different things based on their charge, based on the side chain, based on all these different things. Now, this is like very, very, very low level protein engineering stuff, right? 
majority of people don't care about it. And I probably will say it doesn't matter too much, right? It's like the difference between writing an app or a computer program and building the computer that the app runs on, right? Majority of people will probably never try to build the app. And that's, I mean, build build the computer that the app runs on. Like literally, I don't mean like buy a box and put in, you know, a couple cards and stuff. No, I mean like building the chips from scratch, fabricating the chips and designing those and stuff like that, right? Um, it's uh, something that generally you're not going to have to know about. Um, but it's not terrible to know about. So learn your amino acids. At least have a passing idea of what each amino acid does. Uh, I think... What I did was I made flashcards and I just wrote, you know, the three letter code, the one letter code, the side chain, and like what its overall major characteristic was, right? And then so you could be like, well, what is the side chain of alanine? And you could be like, well, CH3, right? What is that? CH3 is kind of hydrophobic, what people also call nonpolar, right? Alanine, the single letter code is A, and the three letter code is ALA. So when you see these things, you can immediately know. It's, it's like when you play a musical instrument or something like that. It takes time. You have to like start to become comfortable with the instrument and know it, right? It has to become part of you, right? You have to be able to feel it and be comfortable with it and like not have to think every time you pick it up and you use it. And when that starts to happen, that's when you, you start to be able to do really cool stuff. And it's the same thing, you know, with DNA. It's the same thing with proteins and all these different things. When you look at a plasmid backbone, you know, a plasmid map, and <coughs> when you look at a plasmid map and you can look at all the different parts and understand what's going on, right? That's just like you have an intuition that is going to help you create new things, right? That's what it is. It's that intuition, understanding what's right, what's wrong, what could be better, all these different things. That's what science is about. It's just about gaining that intuition. And that intuition is just spending time, right? It's just spending time doing science, spending time reading science, spending time doing all these different things, right? That's it. So proteins. All right. So let's see. So now... There is a database of all the protein structures that have been, they call solved. Um, because that's what it is. You're using a certain technique to solve a protein, to, to figure out what a protein structure is. And... The majority of them are sto stored at this website called rcsb.org. What did I click on? God damn it. So rcsb.org. Now this has the structure of almost every protein you ever wanted to know about. All the proteins. All of them. Right? So... When you do genetic engineering, like in our class, so one of the experiments you're going to do is related to GFP, right? You're going to put the GFP protein inside some bacteria. We can actually look at the GFP protein, and you can see what it looks like, right? So this is a slight mutant of the GFP protein, but they generally look the same. It's what's called a beta barrel. 
a beta barrel is just a protein that is all beta sheets that kind of form a barrel like structure. Now RCSB what you can do is you could click on the 3D view of the structure and you could actually view the protein structure in 3D. So here's the beta barrel. You can drag with your mouse and look up and down it and the sides of it. And this is what the GFP protein looks like, right? So if you wanted to understand how the GFP protein works, you could understand that there are certain amino acids that are inside this beta barrel and that's what leads to its fluorescence. So if you wanted to change the fluorescence of the GFP protein, what you'd probably do is you'd modify some of those amino acids in there, right? If you're just trying to be a cell biologist or study disease or all these other things, you know, this stuff, it doesn't matter too much, but it's still good to know. It's still good to understand that, like, it, you can look at these structures and these structures of these proteins can be engineered, right? Now, if you think about it, like, in terms of medicine, they, <coughs> insulin is a protein, right? And they have engineered long-acting forms of insulin that act for a longer period of time by being able to look at the structure of insulin and modify it accordingly to how it interacts with other proteins. Right? So even if you're just going or, or trying to study medicine, you never know. It might actually help you. You might actually be like one day, Somebody's like, ah, shit, you know, I wonder how we figured this out. And they're like, what if we look at the protein structure? I bet you we could figure it out then. And they'll be like, holy shit, I didn't know you could do that. And you'll be like, booyah. <laughs> so, <laughs> protein. Proteins are these chains of poly, chains of amino acids that form into what they call polypeptide, right? That just means a lot of these different amino acids connected together. And uh, they can form all sorts of cool and useful stuff. Now, the cool thing is, is that people have actually been able to engineer completely new proteins that don't even exist in nature by using nature as a guideline for how to engineer things. So they've created machine learning algorithms and other things to piece together proteins that can have completely new functions that don't exist in nature. Now, a lot of these are enzymatic in nature, right? Now, this is what a lot of the modern synthetic biology companies are trying to do. What they're trying to do is create chemicals, create things that are normally done through a, a chemical synthesis process and make them enzymatic. So an enzyme is just a protein that makes or breaks a chemical bond. So what they're trying to do is say, oh man, you know, we're trying to make this specialty drug molecule or something else, you know, cosmetics are really big right now because, you know, there's two things that you can charge a lot of money for. One is, you know, pharmaceuticals and the other is cosmetics <laughs> and fragrances. So those are the main ones that a lot of people are getting into. Um, but what you can do is you could take this process that doesn't exist in nature. You can engineer the proteins you could find some proteins that are close in nature and modify them just enough, just a little bit, so they can actually do the chemical reaction you want them to do. And then you could remove the whole chemical synthesis process from the manufacturing and make it enzymatic, right? 
enzymatic synthesis usually costs less, right? Because enzymes, they could keep performing the chemical reaction over and over again. So, you, you know, usually in chemical synthesis, you have to add a certain amount of reactants to get your product, right? Whereas enzymes they could keep causing the chemical bonds to be made over and over and over again until a protein dies or something happens, right? So they are a lot more green in terms of like waste and hazardous waste and all these sorts of things. They're really great. So it's a really big field right now. Um, Generally, what that's called is metabolic engineering. So they try to engineer, um, say, a multi-step synthesis pathway in an organism, which counts as like a metabolism, and to create some chemical compound. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's, uh, you know, somebody was able to create uh, the precursor to opioids. What was that? It was a uh... Yeah, I forget what the name of it was. Um but yeah, it they were able to create one of the precursors to opioids to make it easier to produce opioids. They weren't able to make a lot of it. With just the fact that they were able to do this enzymatically was pretty crazy in general, right? So, whew, all right. So proteins are awesome. You should love them. You know how to look at them now and kind of have a general idea of what they're doing. Now, does anybody have any questions? Any questions? Any questions about proteins? Any questions about the lab work? How's the lab work going? Y'all getting the lab work done? Is it moving along? We are on, what, week four right now? And let's see, what are we supposed to be doing in week four? Week four... Learning about calculating concentrations so you can make your own antibiotic solutions. And next week, we're going to do our first genetic engineering experiment. Engineer um, bacteria with GFP to make them fluoresce. Pretty cool. And so finally, get some hands-on genetic engineering. Hopefully, you've learned all the stuff up till now. <coughs> Um, any questions? Any questions at all? If you don't have questions right now, if you're having trouble with your experiments or something like that, make sure you post questions in the class. You know, um, it definitely is helpful, useful for the class. As I always say, <coughs> but, uh, Otherwise, try to stay cool in the heat. If you're in a place that's hot right now, maybe it's just the Bay Area or California. Oof, Oakland, sweating. Um, this is our uh, late summer. We always get a late summer. So, the generally the same principles. So, Barry... For first, let me ask, so Justin, yeah, well, yeast and bacteria and even human cells are kind of similar to engineer. They're not exactly the same, but the general principles are pretty similar. Uh, I don't know. I think in the class, we might just stick to bacteria. Um, we do GFP engineering, and then we do CRISPR. We learn about CRISPR and do CRISPR engineering. Um but I don't think we do any other organism in this class. But say if you were trying to engineer yeast or something like that, the principles would be pretty similar. The protocol is slightly different, but it's pretty similar.
Um, but still, it takes hands-on experience to do it. The thing is, is that E. coli, you're going to use E. coli no matter what you do in genetic engineering because we often replicate DNA in E. coli. So say you're interested in learning more and you take the 102 class, that's what you learn in the 102 class is how to purify DNA, custom-made plasma DNA, how to engineer it so that you could use it, um, how to engineer it for any organism, and all these other things. How do you identify sequences that produce particular proteins? Yes. So what you can do is there's a website called NCBI. NCBI. NCBI.nlm.nih.gov. Now, on this website, what there is is you can search for any protein. Let's say GFP. You want to search for GFP. Now we could go down and we could either look at the gene, it should have somewhere it says, okay, so we could look at the nucleotide sequence of GFP. There should be a protein sequence, is there no, or, or the protein sequence. So for, you can always convert a protein sequence or a nucleotide sequence into each other, right? Because nucleotides using codons code for amino acids. So look, you just search for GFP, you pull it up, and here you go with the protein sequence. There are programs you can look online that'll turn protein into DNA sequences. Now you can also search for specific stuff like glucose, I don't know, transporter, glucose, whatever. You can look for insulin, homo sapiens insulin, right? So you can basically search for whatever you want. A good idea is also just to search the internet. So say if you want to find like enzyme that breaks plastic. What is it called? And let's see. Let's see if we could. So here they say MHE taste. So then we could say MHE taste. You go to the Wikipedia page. At the Wikipedia page, look, they have the structure that's been solved. You can also go, you can click on the RCSB link. At the RCSB link, you can also find the. Uh, this is the sequence, right? So here's the sequence of, of it that you can get here. So there are a lot of ways that you can find out the sequence. Will I be able to get you the protocol for yeast? Justin, if you go to our website, the-odin.com, and you should be able to find protocols for yeast genetic engineering. Um, if you can't find them, uh, Email us or post in the classroom or something like that, and we should be able to help you out. All right. All righty. Anything else? My beer is almost done, so that means it's time to go. All right, if there's no other questions, thank you for coming. Join us next week, same time. Um, and uh, let me know how things are going. Keep up the work. Learn some genetic engineering. It's good for you, good for your health.